Hello, everyone, and thank you for being with us today. We are going to talk about coping with crisis, stress, and trauma, the art of coping and resilience. And here from Israel, suffering together here from all the impact of this horrendous event in the South. I welcome you tonight, and I wish to thank you all for taking the time to join us and to tell you that your support is incredibly meaningful to us. I will uh, try and tell you tonight, uh, as much as I can, some of the uh, symptoms and reactions that we see here uh, through our work in the past uh, few days, and also to think together, how can we help people who are suffering and how can we help ourselves to be part of that? Because being together, being united, supporting each other is the most important thing for all of us in these very, very difficult times. So let us start. Uh, I believe that I need to give you a little bit of background of what is the Community Stress Prevention Center. It is the oldest organization worldwide that has been established in the north of Israel some 44 years ago. We have uh, quite a lot of professionals who are working with us. We're a non-profit organization. And the, the uh, professionals that we are constantly having now have been uh, enlarged with so many volunteers that we are operating in all the relief centers where so many evacuees, so many people who are suffering are now gathered together because their homes either were evacuated or were shuttered and bombed. Over the last 40 years, we trained tens of thousands of people. We delivered over about now 500 thousand hours of uh, therapy and um, we're trying as much as possible to assist both in Israel and outside Israel in times of crisis. In fact, the community stress prevention uh, goal, our mission is to help communities worldwide to cope with the stress and crisis on personal, organizational and national level. In this respect, we have been the ones that designed, designated, I should say, and designed the resiliency centers in the south and in many places here in Israel. And we have been involved in almost all major crises worldwide uh, uh, until recently. Uh, where are we situated? We are in Kiryat Shmona. And as you can see on the uh, screen now, uh, the situation is that Metula and Kiryat Shmona and many other frontline settlements were evacuated to relief centers. And in these relief centers, our staff is managing the psychosocial and educational aspect of it, making sure that people will receive support, making sure their necessities will be covered, making sure they will feel at home despite the fact that they're so far away from their own home and feel that they are cared for. So just to give you a brief idea of how many places worldwide we have been uh, working in the past uh, 40 years. Uh, so we are also, uh, I would say, suggesting to the world what we call tikkun olam and supporting others when they are in distress. Okay, so let's focus on tonight's, uh, I would say, topics. So what are the immediate reactions to the recent traumatic event? I would call it rather traumatic grief because so many people are reacting to the fact that so many have lost their lives, including children, uh, adolescents, adults, families, elderly. So this grief process is so, uh, I would say, common now in Israel and so uh, uh, evident now in Israel. Because grief is something most of us have been through in our life, I would like to convey to you that most people will go through these waves of ups and downs, and with time, probably most people will find some solace, some kind of a respite to their troubles, though they will not forget the sadness, the pain, and their loved ones. But we know that the process of grief is some kind of very, very agitated and aggravated in the beginning, and slowly, slowly, people come to term and start to see that the world, unfortunately, for them, uh, is, is, is still uh, functioning and working, and they slowly, slowly uh, will join the world. 
So what are the experiences that people are facing now? Of course, first of all, it's shock because you can't believe the atrocities, the, 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 the brutality of, of the uh, terrorists. A lot of anger as a result of this energy that is pent up in you and all the frustration of what have happened around you. And of course, re-experiencing the trauma, having a nightmares, having flashbacks of the incident, kind of your brain is still processing it and as if it is living this situation again and again. Unwanted thoughts related to the trauma, that means uh, kind of intrusive thoughts that are coming to you even when you are awakened, of course, when you're asleep. Uh, giving a sense that the event is happening right now, which means it is not over despite the fact that in reality, it is over. Nightmares that are, uh, I would say, making your sleep very, very, uh, uh, very, I would say, um, um, and kind of not really uh, calming, I should say, uh, not really calming. Uh, nightmares wake you up in the middle of the night. Nightmares are making you afraid of falling asleep, staying asleep, etc. Feeling of heightened tension and arousal, a sense of jumpiness and trembling, uh, easily becoming agitated and recreating, uh, reacting strongly to minor things. This is called startle response. Everything is now, uh, everyone is on their toes and everything is agitating people and they react to that. And that is not only for those who are living around Gaza, but also everywhere in Israel because of the sirens. So kids are now very sensitive and also adults to sirens, to sudden noise, to, sh uh, to a, a slamming door and immediately reacting in the alert uh, uh, reaction. Difficulty concentrating because it's very demanding, all this energy, all these fears. So it takes a lot of energy and concentration is very difficult. Of course, uh, uh, falling asleep is a trouble to some. Uh, uh, low sleep quality due to impatience and irritability, all of those are making the life of so many very, very difficult nowadays. What are the immediate reactions to the event, what we call traumatic grief? Therefore, it is highly recommended not as much as possible, not to visit and watch videos of the event as they only intensify the fear and severe reactions. It is known that people feel that they need to see over and over the, the videos, the, 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 the uh, photos from the event. I believe it is also uh, something that happened to you. On the one hand, it's our feeling that we, we wish to be part of things. We wish to uh, kind of know what have happened so that we will not forget. But at the same time, I need to tell you that these photos, these videos are having a very, very negative effect on our brain because our brains are not, uh, uh, I would say, uh, um, uh, created or, or tuned to uh, or to different, to differentiate, sorry, between uh, videos that are virtual than reality. Uh, it's only in the last hundred years that we are used to see moving images that are not reality. And our brain part, the visual part of our brain, is not really making difference between real movement and virtual movement. And so what happened with the enormous stress hormones that we uh, are eliciting when we see these videos, these videos become part of our own memory and our own fears. So as much as possible, as much as possible, avoid uh, watching these videos. And even if you want to know a little bit, by all means, if you watch them once, that's enough. Don't go on and on to watch them, although it's very, very tempting. Perceive the world as an in, in constant threat, causing their body to be in a state of alertness, hypervigilance, which is making it very difficult for them to rest. And that's why I'm one of the most important part in treating and intervening with, with people who have been traumatized is to help them to somehow reduce their arousal. And there are various ways to do so. And that is part of what we're doing now in the relief centers. We are, uh, I would say, joining forces with alternative therapies, acupuncture and the like, and psychosocial intervention to support them, to give them a sense that, yes, they have been through terrible, terrible, terrible things, while at the same time now, in reality, the uh, atrocities have ended. They are now in a relatively safe place where they can 
process things, but try also to calm the system down. In fact, there are all sorts of appetite problems, like people eating too much or eating very little, uh, smoking, drinking, all of these are bodily reactions of the body to somehow get to, to term with what have happened to it. Avoidance is a very natural thing. People are trying to avoid being in any contact with, with uh, any stimuli that, that reminds them of the trauma of the incident. And unfortunately, it's also sometimes avoiding people. And people are the only remedy in these times. Human care is the only remedy in these times. So it is important to accept their uh, avoidance as a normal reaction, but to try to be them with them. Loneliness is another thing. Despite the fact that they can be surrounded with people, their inner feeling is loneliness. The inner feeling of depression and sadness and grief is making them feeling lonely. So presence, even though sometimes you are uh, pushed away, is a key thing for them to feel we are around you. Yes, we can't take a little bit of, of what you've been through, even an inch of what have happened to you, even a milligram of what have happened to you. But we are there. We human beings are around you. We are trying to instill some, some hope that humans are good and not vicious and, and cruel. Shame is another uh, uh, reaction because always when you're in such a normal situation, you're judging yourself as if you were not doing the right thing or you didn't do enough. This is something that we try very much to help them to come to terms with. Yes, some of them did not do what they expect themselves to do, but it is not they, it is their survival brain that told them that they have to do things. In times of crisis like this, you're not fully aware of your decisions. You are mostly governed by your, what we call limbic system and your fight, flight, freeze. And that's what basically control your reaction. Guilt, of course, is coming with the shame, feeling that I didn't do enough, that I shouldn't have uh, uh, abandoned them, that I should this or that or the other. All of these are normal reactions, but in fact, we're trying everything we can to help them to come to term with, with these unfortunate uh, feelings and, and, and reactions they have. What are the basic support principles to help those affected? First of all, and again and again, be there, support, show human care. This is the only remedy to the atrocities, to the cruelty, to the uh, uh, animals that they have met there. So human being is so, human being touch, human care is so important. By empowerment, that means don't make them passive, try to give them a sense that they can take part in their rehabilitation, in, in the, the relief centers. Don't make them passive. Don't, don't leave them to, to feel that they are now incapable. They are, uh, I would say, in pain. They are in grief, but they can be responsible for the little things that they can. And so activation means give them the chance to do things and not be passive. Reduce exposure to media, I've already talked about it, and it's very, very important for people who have been there, although they want to know, to know the news, they want to know what is going on, they want to know if the government is doing what it's uh, uh, actually um, said it will. And so there is a, a kind of a um, negotiation between amount of exposure to non-exposure altogether. Reframing is a very important thing. It is helping a person who've seen himself as coward and saying that, no, you took very good care of yourself. You saved yourself. You're not a coward. This is your limbic system that instructed your body to run away or to hide or to protect your loved ones and not go out. Every action taking <clears throat> that was taken actually contributed to your survival. And so our last thing is to help them to be in some way active. Again, passivity is very, very, um, I would say, uh, reducing the, the, the ability to, to move on, to recover. Because when you are more passive, all your depressive mood, all your grieving, all your fear, all your uh, distress is coming up. And being active, moving your body is part of your recovery because the body keeps the score. The body needs some kind of, of release of that tension. What do we know that happened uh, in, in these cases based on our experience and research? 
Expectations of slow improvement over time and the situation will eventually calm down. But eventually is not tomorrow. Eventually is not in two days time. It, is it will take time, but this is what usually uh, take place with most people. Again, when I'm talking about the general public in Israel, we do expect 10% of the people to have long-term effects of post-traumatic stress disorder. But amongst those who have been exposed to the atrocities, we do expect a lot of them to suffer from PTSD, not forgetting that for the last 20 years they have been exposed again and again and again to attacks from Gaza. So it is important to say that, but it is a, mes a message of expectation of slow, slow, slow process of recovery. Conveying a message that slowly the intense reaction will diminish, which is true, because we can't be all the time on alert. Our body goes up and down, everything is going up and down, and slowly, slowly, it will, for most people, get much less. But it doesn't mean they will forget their loved ones and what happened to them. Empowerment through question, which is how to make them feel that we are willing to listen, what can you do for yourself and your family? That means, let's see how can you mobilize something that will give you a sense that I am back in my role. I am responsible for my family. I can do even very, very little, very little uh, uh, kind of, of decisions uh, or small decisions. I will give you one example today. I was asked about the uh, families who are going to bury their loved ones. And they asked me uh, whether I recommend for kids to join. And I said, only if the parent or the person in charge, the, the caregiver is, is uh, um, okay with that. Make sure that you get their consent. Only then ask the child if he or she wants to join. And even if that is the case, please find someone who will be available for the child throughout the funeral and join the child when the child of any age, I, I usually recommend uh, not uh, younger than nine, to, to go to the grave after the end of the funeral and put a stone or a flower, it depends on how they feel. But it is important to give them the, 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 the choice to make decisions and not to decide for them. Focusing on what help and returning to routine, including accessing services. And we ask people what are what helped the person in the past, what is helping them now, who can assist, including providing information about various support services. And that's for the general public, not just for those who have been severely affected. Do not engage in argument. People are uh, very, very strongly grieving and, and, and painful, sometimes are exploding. Don't, don't go into, into any argument. Don't go into quarrels anyway. It's not a time to go into any argumentations or, or fighting. Try to accept the fact that we are all in the same boat now. We are all trying to make sure that we will uh, uh, get to the shore safely. It will only worsen the situation if we start arguing, uh, arguing. Encouraging them to communicate what they expect from themselves and from the environment. That means tell, let them talk about whatever and, and be a listening uh, a ear, not, not necessarily to give any, any solutions. But again, su suggest a possible resources of support. And the most important support for grieving families is their loved one, their immediate family. Although there are very many good wishes who are volunteering, and I can tell you the amount of volunteerism in Israel now is surmounting, is big, is enormous. It's giving a lot of sense of, of support and togetherness. But still, for a grieving family, the most important thing is their immediate circle of support, their loved ones, their family, their next of kin. These are the people they need around them. And all those around should just support those circles of support and not be, instead of them, or not intrude into the space of the grieving family. What helps us to cope with our ultimate uh, certainty, which is unfortunately our finality? We all know that we are one day will not be, and of course, it is something that disturbs our, I would say, uh, uh, ser ser serenity and, and, and uh, well-being. However, we're doing everything we can to avoid thinking about it all the time. However, when times like this are, are occurring, 
we do face the question of life and death. But it is a human ability that is connected to our ability to uh, perceive future. Because we can perceive future with all the good things about it, we know that somehow in the far future, hopefully, we will also not be. So how do we manage our lives with this knowledge, with this awareness? So we, is, we realized that there are few things that we do, and we call them the uh, continuity principles. Uh, by the way, no one told us uh, as human beings, no one taught us that, not at home, nor in schools, but still every one of us is using these four categories, these four elements to feel something that predicts tomorrow, that yesterday predicts tomorrow, or that is reassuring us that we have some control of our life. So what are these things that are helping us to pass from yesterday to tomorrow? Cognitive realistic continuity is all the norms, all the rules, all the routines, all the daily occurrences that come again and again and gives us a sense that yesterday predicts tomorrow. Our role and function are also very stable. We have been born to a family where our children, we were children or our children, we were uh, uh, and our uh, uh, brothers and sisters, we were students, we are now in our workplace, we are grandparents, all of these are continuous. And because our roles are continuous, and of course our role in our workplace is, is quite continuous, we feel that that helps us to feel that yesterday predicts tomorrow. I'm reassured about what I'm what I have to do or what is expected of me in my role. Social interpersonal continuity is all those circles around us, our immediate family, our extended family, our friends, our colleagues, our acquaintances, all of these are known to us and with them we feel safe. Lastly is the personal historical continuity, which is how do I perceive myself? Am I sure about my values, of our belief system? What is my self-concept? Am I seeing myself as strong person, weak person, optimistic, pessimistic? Do I have a sense of control, or we call locus of control, that I believe that I can manage things, not things manage me? All these are quite constant. Yes, every so often, some of them are kind of uh, getting uh, a little bit... Uh, 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 I would say, disrupted, but altogether, these four continuities give us a sense that yesterday predicts tomorrow. However, when we are in crisis, this is what happened to our uh, um, uh, continuities. Right now, there is a traumatic reality, which is something you don't prepare yourself for. Uh, for changing of procedures. There are so many things. People have left their homes without their rules, without their norms, without their procedures. They don't have previous experience, God forbid, with what's happened. And there is, of course, a disruption of the routine. Role, some of the roles become irrelevant or unknown. What is to be a grieving parent? What is this to be a, a, a orphan? What is this? And of course, there is a lot of ambiguity around what are my, what is my role and what am I expected to do? And also the fact that uh, our interpersonal and social uh, uh, continuity is shuttered uh, because people are in, in sheltered or sealed rooms, remoteness. Uh, there is a lot of contact through screens because people are afraid or are not allowed to go out. As I probably, and I know that you might probably know, uh, five kilometers from the northern border, all the settlements, including the town of Kiryat and Spad and Chatzol, were evacuated, including uh, the, the town of, of Shlomi, and, and, and more and more uh, uh, people have been evacuated. So what are their, their uh, um, new routine? What are their, uh, uh, how can you, they communicate with, with, with their loved one, etc.? And of course, the main question is our historical and personal, because we don't know ourselves as sad, distressed, feeling horror memories, anxieties and worries, depression, pain, sleeping, eating disturbances, not only for those who have been exposed directly to the horrendous images and, and, and behavior of these animals, but also to the vast uh, Israeli population that are now under this continuous stress with this uh, very long time of waiting for the next phase, which we all expecting to happen 
and hoping that the North will stay relatively calm, despite the fact that there are ongoing uh, attacks all the time from Hezbollah uh, on a daily basis. So what happens to families? It is the same because families also have uh, these continuities. Uh, so <clears throat> there are changes in routine and procedures. And again, no pro previous experience and unrealistic stories that they hear and they uh, are, are bombarded with. Of course, roles become irrelevant sometimes or, or very difficult to, to maintain. How can you protect your family when you don't have even a, a sealed room or a protecting uh, a room? How do you maintain functions when you have to be both a parent and a teacher at the same time because children are on Zoom and, and, and uh, take care of the daily routine of the house, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, all this isolation and, and uh, um, the, the um, prohibition of going out is also making life very difficult for families. And the question of, uh, what will happen to us in the future? Is it the same world we knew? All of these are questions that are, in a way, affecting the continuities of families. So where is the opportunity? Where is the prospect? The prospect lies in our ability to create what we call islands of certainty in the sea of uncertainty. Islands of certainty in the sea of uncertainty. That is to try and maintain or bridge a continuity of routine, structure, updated information, be logical as much as possible, clear and make new procedures familiar to all. If you decide as a family to create a kind of a, uh, a system whereby each of you report where they are, try to make sure that everyone knows it and try to take uh, a specific decision on what time do we send this text to each other to, to notice each other where we are. Because uh, in times of stress, not knowing where is, uh, your loved one is very, very distressing. Stress the importance of essential roles, those that we have to stick to. If you're a student and you're expo expected to go to Zoom, try to do that. If you're a parent, don't abandon that role. And sometimes we need to, uh, 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 I, I would say, adopt new uh, roles that, that haven't been uh, before uh, part of our life. Refresh crisis roles, because sometimes we have to prepare for leaving for um, a few hours, if not for days, either in relief centers or in protected sh uh, shelters or rooms. And of course, try to support everyone who is willing to be active and functioning. Emphasize the importance of group support, cohesion, and unifying symbol that's very important that will keep us feeling again that yesterday in some way predicts tomorrow. Remind yourself of what you can do and preserve, preserve your values and maintain dialogue, which is so important because people are trying to either uh, uh, go in or, or, or share emotions, but not in a dialogue way. Strengthen belief in the importance and worth of your work even if they, uh, uh, if they, uh, if now things are, are facing unpredicted situations, that means we have been through difficulties. Uh, we have been through uh, uh, difficult times in the past, and we manage it. So we need to instill hope and give encouraging feedback to everyone in the family whenever they do something that is helping the family to feel that they are in control, that they are doing their best to maintain themselves throughout this quite long period of time of emergency. Why do we speak about community? Uh, it is a very old uh, study that has been done by uh, uh, some uh, researchers uh, headed by Mr. Ro Dr. Rodriguez, and they found that with 30% casualties, we're about to full entropy. Now, for those of you who don't know what is entropy, it's a measure of disorder or randomness in a closed system, in, in inevitable <clears throat> and steady deterioration of a system or society. And we can certainly say that during the events in the South, we have been seeing a, uh, I would say, the, the uh, entropy in, in vivo. That means so many organizations, so many systems did not work. And our effort now, of course, is to uh, instill a sense of coherence and stability helping system to regain their control and function.
because if we are only at 10 and 15 percent affected, which is uh, okay, very, uh, uh, in, in, I would say, in, uh, impactful on the system, still the system can, make, can uh, continue uh, to function. So we, in the community stress prevention, wherever we intervene nowadays, both with individuals, families, communities, we're trying very much to instill sense of coherence and stability, helping these systems to regain their control and function by that, giving a sense that we are in some way balancing and in control uh, as of being in a chaos or, or in this sense of a vulnerability. What is community resilience? Uh, there is a definition that we usually use that was coined by uh, Norris and her team. <clears throat> Sorry, a process linking a set of network adaptive capacities to a positive tra trajectory of functioning and adaptation in residence after a disturbance. That's the general definition of community resilience. But what is it made of? It's made of five elements which we or five factors that we have analyzed and, and identified and created the only measure worldwide to measure community resilience. We're using it quite often to give the local authorities some kind of feedback of where they should put their efforts to help the community to be more resilient. In general, it is about leadership, about preparedness, about attachment to place, which is so, so vivid nowadays, with so many of these very, very affected communities around Gaza that are saying, uh, in, in, at the moment that we will be able to go back, we want to go back and reestablish our homes and reestablish our communities because this is where we belong. Social trust is trusting in your neighbors, trusting that you can do it together. And the collective efficacy is how we can manage it together. How can we really work together to make it happen? Uh, some years ago, we did a study on the difference between Israelis and Jewish community worldwide using the same uh, five elements. And you can see there that, that in general, the Israeli uh, uh, population is a, is as a community is more uh, uh, I would say resilient than than uh, of course the Jewish community. But that means uh, we all have to do our best to be as much as possible uh, ready to um, cope and and fight this uh, uh, situation to make it better to make it better for all of us, both in Israel and outside Israel. How do we cope and is resilience a trade or process? This is taking me to a very long study and model that we have developed already in the early 80s. And we kept on doing research to really learn what helps people, not what uh, is, is making them weak, but what helps them to continue uh, and, and, and cope with impossible situation. We call it the basic pH model. So first of all, I need to tell you the resilience is an innate ability that needs developing and maintenance. By that I mean, we are all born with our ability to be resilient. We have our muscles and we have also our resilience muscles, which means we have them, but we have to train them. We have to develop them and maintain them in order for them to be functional in times when we really need it, such as these times. So resilience manifests itself through coping and what are, how do we cope? So my research on how people make it despite all odds led to the development of the integrative model of coping and resilience. And it means that we found six ways that people, or I would say uh, um, channels that people are uh, making a sense of life and, and coping with it. Let me give you a brief uh, uh, explanation of that. B means belief system. These people are basically using their belief either in God, their religious beliefs, spirituality, and also philosophy, psychophilosophy, which means uh, after what I've been, I can make it or we can make it. Uh, it can be a search for meaning. It can be uh, using rituals. It can be so many things that are to convey that there is a meaning to what I've been through. The second is the affective mode. These people are in need of sharing their emotions, both their positive or nice ones like love and smile, but also their 
not so nice, which is the anger and, and frustration. All of this they need to share with others. They do it either overtly by calling people, by reaching out to people, or for themselves, by writing to themselves, by listening to music and reducing their stress. The third group is the social group. This group of people said to us that they are in need of a very clear role. Once they are enrolled, they're functioning, they, they need to be in a group. They really need to be in touch with their family and to take an active role within a system. The uh, fourth group is those who are using imagination. Imagination in this case is being able to be creative to be uh, uh, using your humor, to using your ability to um, uh, go beyond the, the immediate, uh, to be able to improvise, to use your humor, and also to use arts and crafts or all other artistic methods to process what you've had, and also to divert your attention sometimes instead of looking at the news, uh, go to see a series in, on Netflix or something like that. The cognitive group, usually suggest that they want to know. They know, they need to know the information, they want to collect data, they want to think, they are very realistic. They would like to make plans and to do all sorts of uh, preference orders and look into alternatives. And they also talking to themselves and giving themselves instructions like do that, do that, do that, like a list of things that they have to do one by the other. The last but not least is the physiological group. These people are sharing with us that they need to be active or passive, which is very interesting to say. P active means either to be actively involved in doing something to solve the problem. For instance, those who are working day and night as volunteers to prepare food uh, uh, for those who are in shelters or in relief centers. But there is also what we call active for the sake of activity, like sports like uh, swimming, like going out and walking, like eating, all those activities or all those or preparing food, I should say, all these activities are for the sake of making myself uh, uh, active and by that reducing my sense of disability or my sense of, of stress. Again, here you can find the passive one, which is doing meditation, doing yoga, doing all sorts of, uh, I would say, arousal reducing methods to reduce the arousal. And that is also including sleep and of course rest. All of these are what we call the physiological uh, uh, type of coping modes. So now that you know uh, all of these channels with this very, very brief explanation, you can ask yourself, what are the channels that you're using? And in fact, usually we are able or using at least three to four channels. However, when we are in time of stress, we tend to believe that the way that we cope is the best way. And that might be a cause for some, I would say, argumentation in your family. So I would suggest that you will be aware that different people are using different channels to cope in time of stress. So perhaps you are a very social and emotional person and your partner is very cognitive and practical person. That is not to say that they are not coping or that you're not coping. Each of you have your own way. And usually when we are under stress, we stick to the channels that are most uh, uh, useful for us throughout our lives. When we are facing crisis, sometimes we need someone to remind us of our resources. And that's what we are doing a lot during our work now in the relief centers on the helpline and many other things that we're doing for the sake of Israeli people who have been exposed, both by the way, Jews, Arabs, uh, and newcomers. We're working with thousands of newcomers from all over the world. We are holding a helpline in uh, four languages and trying to support as many uh, of these uh, people who whose Hebrew, for whom Hebrew is not a, a, the first language and not really, uh, um, they, they cannot really use this uh, uh, language to help themselves when they are under distress. So what helps me to cope, and you can see it now in, in this uh, um, um, uh, diagram is again, belief, affect, social, imagination, 
cognition and physiology. Now, let me tell you that we are going to use the same model to help you or to suggest to you how can you take part in supporting us in Israel and take part in the rehabilitation of our nation. So bear with me for a few more minutes. So if you are a B person, I mean, I'm giving you the whole spectrum and you choose, you can of course invent more things. That's very, very uh, uh, common to do that. So B, we need you to trust in us, to stand by us, to create rallies of identification with Israel, with us, pray for our safety and success and initiate moral elevating events. The message was that Israel did not want this war and that Israel was eagerly working for peace. A, send supportive messages, send short videos of care and love, express, spread the emotional messages of those who were murdered, mutilated, and in captivity. So do that to give us this message that these people are suffered a lot and they're still suffering a lot. S, Take an active role, group support, volunteer. I use your creativity, concerts to support us, uh, initiate sophisticated campaign, exhibitions of art of Israeli children from the war zone, all those artwork that they that you can get. Support Israeli artists and performers. C, plan a comprehensive and long campaign. It's not a short campaign. Prepare for the long process of support and rehabilitation. Be updated on what the needs are and what's going on in Israel. And PH, be active, support respites, take care of your well-being so that you can have the energy to be with us. Let's take a moment to think about hope. We do need hope. It is important for us to instill hope. So hope is the emotional state that promotes the belief in a positive outcome related to the events and circumstances in one's life. It's important to say that the difference between hope and optimism, hope entails pathways and thoughts to an int intended goal. Optimism leads one to expect the best, but it doesn't necessarily provide any critical thinking about how we are going to arrive at this improved future. So S Snyder suggests to us, how can you create hope? Sorry, hope. How can you create hope? Hope is the sum of the mental willpower, way power that you have for your goals. It, it actually has three underlying concepts. The first is goals, our objects, experiences, or outcomes that we imagine and desire in our mind. The goals involving hope fall somewhere between the impossible and true things. Willpower is the driving force in hopeful thinking, and way power reflects the mental plans of roadmaps that guide hopeful thoughts. So this is the theory, but what is it is in practice? In practice, I want to say to all of us that we as people, for over 2,000 years, we basically managed to exist using the hope or focusing on one hope. We need to remember that for 2,000 years, we were exiled, we were uh, uh, tortured, killed, persecuted, but still in those difficult times and dark ages, we had one hope that every year we say at the end of the Haggadah, next year in Jerusalem. It's amazing that this little hope had created the impossible event worldwide that a forgotten people, a people without land, were managed to recover and come back to the land. In psychology, we call it the uh, wish for the eternal return. That means that people would love to see those who are not anymore to come back. We are in Israel, I would say, fulfilling the impossible of coming back of the uh, important thing that we call the eternal return. It is 
our mission. It is our responsibility to make sure that this hope is not shattered. We call you to take part in that, to instill this hope, to maintain this hope, and to be with us in this very, very long road to recovery. Fredrickson, in her very interesting chapter on why we need hope, says, hope comes into play when our circumstances are dire, when things are not going well, or at least there is considerable uncertainty about how things will turn out. She states that hope literally opens up and removes the blindness of fear and despair and allows us to see the big picture, thus allowing us to become creative and have belief in a better future. So I do call you to join us in our mission to assist our community. Your presence and support are invaluable to us. And please take a photo of this uh, 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 HTTP, this uh, uh, address here, so that you can take part in our effort of the Community Stress Prevention Center and also get a lot of information and support from our uh, site. So by all means, you are welcome to uh, visit our site, which is icspc.org, www.icspc dot org and as i'm talking to you there is a siren here so i need to stop our uh, video and thank you again for being with us <laughs>